Uh, what we're going to do today and in this talk is we'll start with a demo and then it will be a long-winded discussion of two years of learning essentially. What have we found? How have we constructed this application? And what might you do to improve it? Let me see if I can improve this very carefully. Okay, how about now? Perfect. All right, all right, all right, all right. Okay, so let's do a daring demo. So I have a couple of things. One, I have two. So these are eye beacons, find location. And they will help our classification. And I have a couple of sensors. So an Apple Watch with some private APIs. Uh, I know that's naughty and Apple wouldn't approve, but we needed it. And uh, I have a pebble, so that gives more real-time information. We are able to write code that actually sends the data immediately. Uh, well, we, ag we have to buffer for one second. So we record one second of accelerometer and gyroscope data, and that's what gets sent to the mobile application. All right. So now that this is all nearly set up, OK. So we're ready to go. This is the connection, right? So this is like a remote connection. Let's see how that works. Well, not too bad, not too shabby. Let me uh, start it. OK, so what we're going to do is see what it does. And then we'll talk about how it's built and how we've gone about building it and what were the mistakes and how it went. Ready? All right, let's go. So it's, it's nice and simple, right? We run the app, and it does exercise slash physiotherapy. So we went through a number of iterations, particularly when it came to sensors. You know, what can we get in real time? And what else can we get from the support in the gym? So we have a statistical model of what the user does. So if I wander down to a location where I can start exercise, and grab a weight, imaginary weight, do a setup movement, and as soon as I do that, this detected that I'm holding a weight, imaginary weight, very heavy, and I can start exercising. And all that it does is record all the accelerometer traces and provide you know, the user some feedback of what to do, what weight to get, and how many repetitions to do. And I have to stop moving, and then we'll say, okay, here's what you've done. Suppose it was 15 kilos, it must have been, right? What I also got was immediate confirmation. I'm near this, right? I'm gonna wander over here. So the beacon, I'm now away from the beacon. I'm gonna walk over to this one, right? Let's do something a bit, bit heavier. So it should pick it up any minute now. Come on. There we go, right, so it picks up that, and it really wants me to do this. So let's get set up, right? There might be a delay, and let's get going, right? So I'm ready. Should be getting a boat ready to do it. And off we go, right? One, and so on. Count with me, right? This is ridiculous. I feel completely, completely ridiculous. But it feels great, right? This is so light. If you exercise in the gym with the real deal, you'll find this completely magical. All right, <laughs> nearly done. OK, last one. All right, and done. So again, opportunity to provide enough. I'm glad that this worked. Uh, let's not push my luck any further. So that's what it does. It's nice and simple, right? I didn't have to touch anything. All I had to do was walk around and exercise. How easy. So told you about a statistical model of, user exercise, of the user behavior. Humans are beautifully predictable animals, right? So when someone exercises, they usually do the same thing all the time. So it's really easy to build a transition model from the different exercises. So when I stand, start an exercise session that targets, I don't know, arms and legs, and then it knows that I typically start with exercise A, and that I 15 times move over to B. And from B, I three times stay at B, and one time go to, to A, and so on. So that is the initial cut of predictions. You know, what am I going to do? This is a suggestion. Do this next. Well, that's sometimes not sufficient. 
So I have this, these two eye beacons, this fine location. So when I go over here, it says, all right, so you are likely, you could have been doing A, B, C, and D, but now that I'm standing here, it says, okay, well, we're gonna be doing just A or C. There might be some other A's and some other C's, but you know, it gets filtered down depending on what kind of exercise I'm about to do. Okay, well, that, that, that's kind of good, right? So suppose I now have two options of what to do. When I was here, right, I had two options. And then finally, I have the sensor data. So there are a load of papers that you can download that talk about classification of, of exercise. And they usually require long time windows. So you're looking at five seconds, maybe eight seconds worth of data. And that's completely insufficient when the feedback has to be immediate, right? So I had to do this, and the thing had to say, get ready, now. I couldn't be doing eight seconds worth of movement and then for it to say, oh, I see you're now exercising. I'm like, no, I have started eight seconds ago, Just, this is all broken. So the combination of these three factors, if you think about it, right? It's the combination of typical statistical movement of the user. What does the user do typically? Plus find location, plus as many sensors as you can get on someone. So I started with two, so heart rate accelerometer, accelerometer gyroscope. We have other experiments. In fact, I'll talk about this fully wired human. And a fully wired human has, in fact, I'll tell you later. It's, it's very exciting. All right, so how did we get there? It was a long road. I started at Scala Exchange two years ago. And I had a CQR SES application in, in ACA. So I had all the user profiles. I had cluster sharding. I had event sourcing. Martin talked a lot about you know, using that, treating all the events as streams. It had REST API for user profiles, it had a mobile application, that all worked reasonably well. And it did this real-time ingestion of accelerometer data. Ha. See, now that's, that's where everything failed. But anyway, you know, all the processing was on the server, we had Apple push notification to the app. So, what worked? Well, clearly CQR SES in Aka. Perfect. REST API. Not a problem. We had Swift and Swift Z. Uh, any guesses, what is Swift Z? Oh, come on, it's Scala Z, right, but in Swift. Um, we had sensor data ingestion and decoding with S codec, which was really quite cool. So these guys sent big endian 13-bit signed integers. We need to decode them in some sensible way. S codec was fantastic. Um, there was no actual classification. Everything else was cool, though. So, uh, typical ARCA. Um, cluster sharding setup, so backed by Cassandra Journal. So to do this user profile and user profile processor, all I had to do was create a cluster shard for the, for the sharded actor, and Akka took care of distributing it across all the nodes. It took care of you know, all the details of routing messages to it. If I needed um, an actor that was just local on an actor system, it was even easier, right? Not a problem. This sort of thing, right? APIs, if we all, well, okay, that, that might be an exaggeration. We should all have written uh, a service in Spray or Arca HTTP. Even if you've done Ruby on Rails, this is readable, right? So this is a service that handles uh, some HTTP requests. It uses the user exercises and the user exercises view as actors. And, uh, you know, this is actually really pretty simple. Anything that starts with exercise followed by an identifier for a user, an identifier for a session. When there's a get request, we complete it by asking the user exercises view for a response to user get exercises readable, right? Not, nothing too bad. On a put, we handle this bit vector. Now, this was the ingestion, right? So the mobile phone, every time it had a, it tried to buffer but it tried to send all the data from the sensors immediately for processing. It encoded them as bit vectors. This is from S codec. And uh, all we had to do in this user exercises processor, which was a persistent actor, right, and some logging, all we had to do is decode it. Now, in here you can also see how we typically go about switching the state, right? So we start by not exercising, so the receive behavior by default is not exercising, right? So presumably someone would have to press a button that says, I'm exercising now, right? So we would go from not exercising, a 
kind of behavior to this exercising behavior. And when we had this put request that received all the data, we would decode all. And on left, on error, we'd say, oh, well, you sent me an HTTP 400. This is some stuff that I don't know how to decode. And on HTTP, on um, success, right? So if we decoded all these bits, um, we sent it to these exercise classifiers, and presumably they spit out the actual exercise. All right, so when I talked about these 13-bit things, this, this is what happens on Pebble. Right? It's a tiny machine. You, you have like 18 kilobytes for your code and memory. Kilobytes. So this, you don't have a lot of space. So what do we have to do? Well, this is how we decode it, right? So we first decode the header. Magic gives us uh, an idea of endianness, big endian, little endian. We can look at the order of bytes. And then we can decode the rest of the stuff. Now, 13, 13, 13, 39 bits, plus one padding. So we have five bytes per sample. Uh, this is just enough to squeeze through reliably uh, through a Bluetooth low energy connection. So that's kind of cool, right? And then the data, this, this bit vector, got sent to exercise classifier. This is what we had at Scala Exchange. That. Right? I mean, that was kind of cool, right? I'll, I'll do it again. I'll show you in, in full horror we had that. <laughs> oh, a timeout. Uh, do you want to hear a TCP joke? Anyway, don't do this, right? This is a terrible idea. Uh, OK, so we fixed that. So we, needed, we, thought, we thought, let's do this actual classification. So we did horrible things. I mean, they, they were cool. But if you're thinking about doing these things, don't do them. So we hand rolled an SVM. We wrote some R code, and we thought, oh, this is it. We did manual feature extraction. We wrote hand rolled SVM. We used radio kernels. And that was kind of cool. We used Breeze for the, all the uh, linear algebra, and that worked beautifully. We even had some um, dynamic logic in there, uh, with time. And we added in uh, an SMT solver. So the idea was that an exercise is a sequence of basic movements, and they follow in some bounded time. So what we would say is, you know, a squat is this movement, followed by, at some point in the future, this movement. And if that times out, then it's clearly not a squat. Um, yeah, that, that turns out not to work, really, uh, because of the lag of user interface. And the, the bad things were the JNI connection to an SMT solver, which forced us to use JDK 1.7 in a particular version of Ubuntu, so it was all pretty terrible. But it was cool, right? I mean, we had working uh, dynamic logic over finite traces in, in an ACA stream. We had Vagrant and Puppet as an automated um, infrastructure build, so that was kind of cool. Unfortunately, we had to use the CVC4 development packages, and we had to depend on JDK 1.7. And the only thing we could classify, this is the cool stuff, right? In all of this glorious setup, the only thing we could detect was this. But, but it was beautiful, right? Radio kernels and all that. Um, and we had no proper training and test data sets. So this is where I'm getting towards what is kind of difficult. So we had this, right? An SVM. Uh, we didn't actually just use the Taylor expansion of the radio kernel, which was sufficient enough to do the prediction. And then we wrote this kind of stuff, because we didn't know any better, right? This worked, but really we could do better. Then we tried this with this um, complicated dynamic logic over finite traces. So we would split these things. We'd have a query evaluator, which returned future of queries. These would be the dynamic logic queries that we would run in an ACA stream. So we ended up with this, a couple of flows. So the main flow is a thing that goes from sense and net value, which identifies some elements at a different points of a human body, through an evaluator to a decider. So this is how it all flowed. And it was all beautiful, and it was a terrible idea. It looked cool. And this is what I talked about at Scala Days in San Francisco. So if anyone wants to have a look at what I thought back then would have worked, uh, have a look at the talk. But it didn't. And we had the main workflow where we, you know, the only thing that we could classify here was a tap. And we even wrote this beautiful interface to an SMT solver. And then, unfortunately, we had to do this sort of stuff. It was pretty terrible, right? And yet, if you want to do dynamic logic, this is the thing to do. CVC4 actually works. 
And the code that we have here, you can write um, dynamic linear dynamic logic with finite traces. So if you need it for your app, definitely grab it. So oh, we thought, oh, OK, that, that's a terrible idea. Let's move all the computation to the mobile app, just like you've seen here. Right? So everything got evaluated on the phone. I didn't need to do anything on the server, except we thought, ah, we have a CQRS application. That's kind of cool. We have all the events in the journal. How about we use all these events in the journal as inputs for the Spark job? Surely we have not, a, not just the user registration and profile setting, we have the sensor data. OK, OK, well, we tried. Um, we had distributed computation. You know, we had a cluster of Spark machines. We had 20 megabytes of data, right? So that was, uh, that was a bit of a bummer. Um, we had very, very naive model evaluation and testing. By that, I mean we just computed something, and uh, well, that's what we had, right? Ta-da! Um, there was no way to keep historical rolling best models. So if we computed, if we fitted a particular model, we didn't remember anything. We just, whatever we computed on the day is what got delivered to the mobile application. So that was pretty terrible. And we tr treated all the users the same. Remember, well, we had 20 megabytes of data, so we had one user. OK, so that wasn't great. Um, model storage and delivery. Well, uh, I say rudimentary. We had files. Files on one machine. That's how bad it was. So uh, terrible ideas are use of Archive Journal as source of data for the Spark jobs. Because you tie yourself down to, if you write a message in Akka, obviously it ends up as a blob in this journal. You can wire in uh, a bit better serializers, which, we, which is what we ended up doing, but it's still not good. Uh, second point, I think, is, is crucial, right? 20 megabytes isn't big data. Uh, 20 gigabytes isn't big data. 20 terabytes probably is. But that's when you should get, start getting interested in it. Everything else will fit in memory. That's it. Why, you know, why bother? And we learned that uh, production machine learning models need really reliable way of model evaluation, of model storage, of test data, and training data management. Without it, we, just, we were guessing. And ultimately, these, these models are the gold dust, right? So, so the files the models that get delivered to the mobile app, it's still roughly 10 megabytes of floating point numbers. And it's been like that for a year, except now we have better 10 megabytes. And having the right 10 megabytes is, is the gold dust. All right, so um, I talked about serialization. So even if you're not doing these horrors that I talked about, you should, uh, in, in a CQRS, in event sourcing, use something a bit better than Java IO serializable. So we ended up with Creo, uh, a particular fiddly version of Creo, which l ran really well with Spark. So we were on 2.12 in the main um, Actum system, and we were on 2.11 in Spark, and we just needed to make it all connect. So that worked. Um, and then we did this, which is really horrific. Right? So we saw all the journal in the Spark job, and then we only matched on some events say this one, user exercise, process of persistence. Uh, and we got the exercise session, which allowed us to grab the samples, the you know, samples with labels, and we did some processing of that. Um, that's a terrible idea, because you're doing so much work. It's much better uh, to just store the data in, in the right form. So I'll call this a deferred success. It was all a deferred success, because we explored some fantastic topics, and we learned many, many, many things. So the pattern that you can see on this slide, really, is that the mechanics works. You know, Akka works. The type safe stack really works. Secure CS in Akka. Brilliant. REST in Akka and Spray in Akka HTTP. No problem. Hacks with Swift and Swift Z. You know, fine. Uh, sensor data ingestion, decoding with S codec. All good, right? It all worked. Uh, the actual classification was a bit tough, right? So that didn't work. So, you know, success for a big machine learning project. So we went on, right, and we got to working um, dynamic logic in an Akka stream. So Akka stream worked. And dynamic logic worked. Well, not a surprise, right? Everything else was pretty terrible. And then we got to this final stage where, well, it was all terrible. 
right? So the mechanics, the, the building blocks are right, except uh, what is important is to use them in the right way, and this really isn't. Um, well, as Google suggests, right? I mean, I'm, I'm frightened about the third one, right? So are we really down to self-aware? I mean, it, it is, right? But tell me what. <laughs> Anywho, so this is what we have now. This is what we think now is the right way of doing it. It turns out that this, this works, as you've seen. So we have this, the same old stuff, right? We have sensors. We have a mobile app. The mobile app now does all the processing. So it receives all the, all the models and all the architectures for the models. It builds this, this tiny Markov chain of in-session prediction. And it makes small in-session um, linear predictions, right? Because users will generally do tiny changes in one session. But between sessions, they'll, they'll make bigger ones, which we can compute in the rest of the system. We have an ACA cluster that holds the user profiles. Um, and it handles the ingestion of the sensor data. So when the session ends, we submit the whole block with the, with the labels and all the sensor data. Uh, it's a CQRS system, so we have a journal with messages and s with events and snapshots. That works really, really well. We also write the same events, the sensory data we expand. We write them into properly structured Cassandra tables, not just a blob. Now, we read, we cluster the users, right? So now that we have a few more users, we need to cluster them because, uh, you know, I'm getting old and uh, some young people exercise in a completely different way. And older people than me, not many, but, but they exercise in different ways still. So we have, at the minute, we have 10 clusters of users and that, that's sufficient, you know, by age group, by sex, by self-reported um, exercise proficiency, I suppose. And then we have a whole bunch of machine learning tasks. So they actually fit these setup movements that I've done, these crucial first, second movements. We need to train on those, and we use the labels uh, to do that. The model parameters end up again in a database, and they get read, or they get notified that we have a new model to our ACA cluster, and that gets pushed over to the Apple's content delivery system, because we don't actually like to send these 10 megabytes. Uh, it costs too much money. Now, I am frightened that many people will just use these apps with no concern to privacy. I mean, who, who here uses, say, Strava? There we go. Um, are you not worried? You know, there are people who know, who can just look. And these are, this is even worse. This is, you know, really biometric data. If we have a fully wired human, this sends a lot of information. It's possible to find out lots of things. So we use unstable identifiers throughout. Now, for physiotherapy, our unstable identifiers are unstable for just one session. So you can't really connect um, the behavior to one specific user. So do that. Um, technologies, the usual lot, right? iOS on the mobile and Swift. We have Akka, we have Cassandra, we have Spark, we have Keras. Um, mainly for experiments, right? Because we can use that as an abstraction over either Theanu or TensorFlow. So TensorFlow in the real big application, and locally I have a tiny little sec set of Docker uh, containers, and we can train locally on Theanu. And we have Mesos to run all of this on AWS, because uh, I want to save money, I want to squeeze as much power out of it as possible, and I don't want to worry about things. So Aga, you know about Aga. This is not difficult. It's a reactive service for user profiles, CQRCS implementation, uh, it uses Cassandra for the events and the journals, but it also writes properly structured data um, to Cassandra. And it then reads and, uh, the, the model parameters that we've computed, and it delivers them to Apple, which then delivers them to uh, the mobile applications. And we have Spark right now. I talked about this fully wired human. Uh, there aren't that many. So we, between our, what could it be, about 200 years, but keep it between these 200 years. I know it's going to be on YouTube, but hey-ho. Um, so we have some smart clothes that have some really, really cool sensors. So we have strain gauges along every major, major muscle group. And so we have a few people who are what we call fully wired. And so these people can generate an awful lot of data. Uh, to give you an idea, one sensor generates about one megabyte per hour of exercise. So four sensors. Now what, right? So if I'm a fully wired human with now four sensors, 
then if I train a model that uses all these four sensors, they will be usable only for other fully wired humans. Well, I sort of want to use every bit of that, right? So I need to split it into combinations. If I have these two sensors, I need to have a model that does both, that does one on the left wrist and one on the right wrist. If I have more sensors, I need to, you know, make all these combinations. Um, and then, you know, we use Spark for the typical, what I would call, big data tasks. Now, they are really interesting. So we might, and, and this is real, might have submitted a proposal, a research proposal for a big EU project, and we might actually have injured people, which is kind of, I mean, it's not cool, but it's useful, right? We will actually be able to do a good job. So what, what I did, this sort of pattern of behavior, you know, transition from one exercise to the next, what we can now answer is, what is the most, what is the best, most efficient uh, set of transitions to do gain, I, I don't know, uh, muscle mass gain or uh, fat loss? But for this Horizons project, we will be able to answer questions like, what is the best sequence of exercises to improve mobility, to recover from injury? So that will be really, really exciting. Um, oh my, we, we have a mistake that that seems to have crept in. Um, that's, that's like a terrible idea, right? Imagine if you have fully wired human, 20, people, 20 sensors. So we would compute all these combinations and write them to Cassandra. We would have so much data. Well, this actually belongs in the machine learning job, right? This is the thing that prepares the data set. So what we have in the Spark job is we don't touch the sensor data. We cluster them into groups by profile data, but then we leave the rest. We do the machine learning and uh, you know, model fitting entirely in our cluster of now Python jobs uh, in KRS, which you know, gives us an abstraction over either Theanu or, or TensorFlow. So we do sensor data pre-processing. We expand the sensor data into all the combinations that we have. So just this one, just this one, both, and you know, whatever else I'm wearing. And then we have training and evaluation programs. This, again, shouldn't be too unfamiliar for anyone who's doing or trying to do machine learning. So you have a program that trains, that selects a subset of data, calls it the training data set, or we have the test data set. You fit some model, then you evaluate its performance. And you need to write the best model out. So what we do is keep 10 best models, including their architectures, including the activation functions, the shape of the network, and the parameters. And every time we run, we select the 10 best ones. And sometimes we randomly mutate them. So we might flip an activation function and just, we actually have no systematic way of doing it at the moment. We just do a random mutation, but we remember the 10 best, best ones. And that seems to do a really good job. So, um, you know, this is right down to Python. So we load um, the model on here. We have some you know, hard-coded network. It, it turns out that three layers will, will do the job, right? Load the data and uh, construct, uh, in, it, in this case, just a multi-layered perceptron, and fit it, compile it, fit it. Depending on which backend you use, this will end up as a, as a TensorFlow job or as, as a Theano job on, on this machine, and we're good to go, right? So again, just to give you an idea of what it looks like, here are three exercises. This is accelerometer, XYZ traces, and the big blue areas, these are the areas of, of labels. Now, if we you know, train on all of these blocks, that's, that's too much. And besides, it means that we have to submit all these samples. Well, that's not going to work. We need, and this is difficult to see, so I've highlighted them. We need just the first second, the setup movement, right? So what we have is a combination of, we know where we are geolocation. So we know what the user might be able to do. So we can pinpoint it down to a particular gym or a particular hospital. We know fine location inside a building. So we know really, if I'm standing here, there are only so many things I can do. And I also know the sequence of exercises that I like to do them, that I like to do in a particular session. So that really, really, really narrows it down. And then I have this confirmation of, oh, now the sensors are telling me that I've done a particular movement. Surely this must now be such and such exercise. So this is how we train it. And, you know, the usual evaluation, um, we get down to, you know, pretty bloody good loss and reasonable accuracy. You know what, let's see it. I have another daring demo, of course. So I have a couple of other Docker containers running, take my word for it. Um, let's 
slip right through that. I have final one to run. Uh, I know, make file. So we have make file, which calls a Docker file, which calls a whole bunch of others. Okay. So there we have it. Um, all the other containers have started up, I trust. So here is what it looks like. All right, not too bad. So let's just run all the cells so we can see how we load the data. So this is the data that we've submitted from Cassandra. Where are we? There we go, right? So these are the samples I've shown you. So we just plot them. We then select just the first second for our labeling. Uh, we append and merge all the data frames. So we'll, we'll have to wait for a bit. Now, some of you who, who might have done some Spark will, will look at this and there should be something suspicious. Any, any, any takers? So Python, we're cool, right? We can, we can use Python in, in Spark notebooks. Anything else suspicious? So localhost 8888 sounds reasonable, but the logo is wrong. Uh, this is not a Spark notebook. This is actual Jupyter notebook uh, with a connection to Spark. So there's a, there's a Docker container that does that, and there was a little bit of a problem. That, that, that could be right down to me in using Spark notebook, particularly with Theano, and particularly with TensorFlow on GPUs. That just crashed all the time. So I ended up just using Jupyter with connection to Spark. And so if you're doing experiments with Spark Notebook, if you're then running you know, native Python code, you're probably cool. So here we are. It's still doing it. It's, it's making noise, so, so I'm sure it's, it's actually working. Uh, and then we'll see if we can you know, wait for this to train and to fit all the this. I'll, I'll, you know what? I'll just keep it running. I'll go back to my slides. We'll come back to it. Right, so daring demo is in progress. Machines are working. Um, so check that one out. Uh, that's actually quite helpful. All right, so, so now that we had all this code, that, that was kind of great. Um, and it ran on this machine, and it ran on a couple of other machines that I had in my office, but you know, we needed to run it as a service for someone to use. So this was in the days before open source DCOS. So we ended up on plain Mesos, with a couple of frameworks ran, running a couple of tasks. So marathon for the long-running tasks. Long-running ones, I mean Cassandra cluster. I mean the, the Akka cluster. I also mean the, the Spark jobs. And finally, the machine learning jobs, the, you know, the Python um, tasks. Um, what we wanted in our runtime environment is something simple, uh, something that would be easy to, to manage, easy to orchestrate, easy to work with. So if I have my machine, that one, I want to be able to use it in a, in a very convenient way. Support for many polyglot, polyglot languages, that's just terrible. I'll edit it out before I give the slides out. This is shocking, right? I mean, that, that, that thing. Anyway, um, polyglot frameworks and components, uh, we need a cost effective resource utilization. So if I have a whole bunch of Amazon machines, I need to make sure I squeeze as much out of them as possible. So we ended up with Docker, which allowed us to deploy this reliably and consistently. So I can build a Docker machine, publish it to a registry, and really uh, be happy with it. Um, really quick startup, you've seen it. If the daemon were running, it would be all good. Um, it was pretty simple. Um, developer and friendly workflow, ultimately, right? So we have a DevOps team, which could build all sorts of complicated stuff, all the way down to these vagrant boxes. But I didn't want to do that. I'd much rather that you know, the actual software team, two people, could do it. Um, so we did this, right? Dockerized this Cassandra environment. So if I have a cluster of Cassandra machines and on this MacBook Pro, well, you know, we need to give it as little memory as possible. So that turned out to be okay. You know, tiny heap, uh, no caches, nothing at all. So if I could run it on my machine for testing. Uh, in production, that was slightly different. Uh, it needed more parameters and it needed, you know, uh, the, the caches and the data needed to be mounted on specific volumes so, that, so that I could have immutable containers rather than worrying about mutability. Uh, Dockerizing Akka cluster is actually really easy. Right? So Docker plugin with SBT assembly we ended up using, make a fat jar, expose the port, and you know, we're, we're done with it. Um, for development, 
there's a setting that you can say, oh, here it is, right? Where it says, don't cache the image that you create. So this is part of our um, SBT. So just specify the dependencies. When I type in SBT Docker, it first, first makes this fat jar. Um, grab the Java image that has JDK and all the different components, expose port 8080, which is where the REST API sits, and I'm done with it. Give it some name, and what I said is, you know, for development, you might not want to cache the generated, generated image. Okay. Oh, yes, here we are. Docker is um, production environment for Cassandra, so immutable images, right? So the data, commit log, and saved caches go on mounts, they don't go into the, the container. Run Cassandra in the foreground, right? I mean, I've done it so many times when I run the, the Docker process and it just dies. And Marathon goes, oh, I'm gonna start a new one. Oh, that died, I'm gonna start a new one, so don't forget minus F. Um, that turns out to be a bit of a, it's easy to spot, right? Then we had Mesos, which this is the official line, right? distributed systems kernel, tens of thousands of nodes. We don't have tens of thousands of nodes, for the record. We have 20, but still, you know, I don't want to manage them. Um, nice support for, for Docker containers, which was really important. So um, this is, the, again, the official architecture. Uh, what we do is map frameworks that describe the tasks that run in them. So we have a framework for Cassandra. We have a framework for, for Spark. We have a framework for the, for the ML jobs, framework for Akka, and then the tasks are the individual things that, that run. And finally, and this is nearly the end, um, I, you know, I, this was my slash cake solutions money. So we didn't really want to spend money at all, if possible, which is why computation happens on user devices. You might have gone to the Scala JS talks where the guys keep saying the same things. I don't pay for it. The browser, the, these devices that users pay for, that the users feed, they can run a lot of it. So we do that too. We use spot instances wherever possible. So for all the Spark jobs, they all run on spot instances. All the uh, machine learning model fitting tasks, they all run on spot instances. If they die, they die. But they, they cost half the money, which is kind of cool. And in Mesos and Marathon, I can actually support a scenario where I'm running and then Amazon says, no, nope, uh, you know, we're gonna take these 10 machines away from you because they're now too expensive. You paid 50 cents per hour. We're now charging them at 60, they're gone. We're okay, we can, can recover. Um, Zookeeper, yeah, don't run Zookeeper on spot instances. That would be a terrible idea. Um, perhaps don't run your, your database on spot instances. That also would be a terrible idea. But nearly everything else we run on spot instances, and that all works really well. So, where to next? So, what's going to happen in the next couple of months? Fingers crossed, right? We'll have our big research project funded. We have four institutions working on it, a couple of other companies in Europe, and that will allow us to really push for fully wired human smart wearables. Um, the t-shirts, so, so it looks like a, actually a t-shirt and, you know, uh, shorts, I suppose. They're not too expensive. They, they are cheaper than the fashionable ones that you could buy. And they come with strain gauges and sort of conductive fabrics. And then we have a Bluetooth module that's, that's about this big, right? And that fits into a pocket, and that sends us all the data that we have. So in addition to 50 hertz from these consumer sensors, we have 10 hertz samples for every major movement. And if you look at, we measured the performance of our classifiers, and if you, these are fairly good. But then we measured F1 of a fully wired human, and we were consistently getting 1.0. So we were very, very, very pleased. Now we still don't have a notion of quality of exercise. We don't know what it is. So we can tell you you've done this movement, we can tell you what it was. We can't tell you whether it was good. So that's a lot of work that we're going to have to do. It will end up with you know, physiotherapy, injury prevention, smart wearables, all this good stuff. So um, the official line is that we are a Cake Solutions company, uh, you know, very, 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 very experienced Scala programmers. We are based here and in London, and in Manchester, and we're hiring. So if anyone wants to do this sort of crazy stuff, the stuff that Martin talked about, the stuff that uh, Better talked about, talk to us. Um, and that's it. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? <laughs> Oops, no.
I'll keep this on. Oh, yes. Good, good, good question. It finished. Of course it did, right? So thank you for that. So we, we did it. We, tr we fitted uh, a three layers with hyperbolic tans. And we trained, what was it, 30 epochs. And we got down to 0 0.03 loss and 0.42 accuracy. So that sounds really bad, right? But these are many different exercises. What you need to do the actual recognition is the external context. So you know what the user is likely to do. You know where the user is standing. So that allows you to weed out all these other options. And if you think about, there are exercises that we can't recognize. So if you do this and you do some sort of kicking, uh, well, we're, we're stuck, right? Because you know, these don't move. So this is where more sensors will help. Uh, no one really wants to wear anything on their ankles for some reason. Uh, so <clears throat> you know, we have to give them the smart clothes. So they end up as raw values of floating point numbers. So we persist the weights and the biases. We know the layout of memory, and we dump them into just an array of floating point numbers. So we run on single precision. And we then shift the models back to iOS, and we can evaluate them on the, using the, the DSP and the vector units. So all the computation that happens on the phone is actually done using vectorized operations, which is really cool. We end up as about 5% CPU usage, even when the data is coming in. So it's the same. Oh, hang on. I'll repeat the question. I'm really sorry. So what do we use for Spark instance provisioning? So these are all um, marathon jobs on Mesos. So the Spark jobs take you know, some time to use. We use marathon also for scheduling. So we run at a particular time in, in the day when typically the AWS instance costs are, are lowest. So we just say, make so many tasks of this kind. The Spark jobs take about 20, 25 minutes to run. So we say to, to uh, Marathon, run this, and then kill the jobs when they're finished. All right, uh, well, I'll take stunned silence as a thank you. And thank you for your attention, and enjoy the rest of the Scala days.